friends, Christy Teji here, your host for the Productive Passions Podcast. Let me ask you, is there something different you dream of doing, but don't know where to begin? If you're feeling suffocated, anxious, or you feel there's something different calling you, come along with me for candid conversations with people who have embarked on a journey to put their passions to work for them. Buckle up and enjoy the ride. Life is too short to stay stuck. In today's episode, I'm speaking with Diane Monty. I won't yet reveal what she does. You'll soon discover that for yourself. But in preparing for this episode, I rediscovered my own interest in the teachings of Dr. Carl Jung. As I am many years older than when I was initially introduced to his teachings, these concepts now resonate with me more deeply. Jung, the renowned psychiatrist, believed the purpose of life was self-realization the discovery and fulfillment of an individual's potential. He famously said, I am not what happened to me. I am what I choose to become. And the privilege of a lifetime is to become who you truly are. He also reminded us that even a happy life cannot be without a measure of darkness. And the word happy would lose its meaning if it were not balanced by sadness. In earlier episodes, My guests share personal struggles and failures, which significantly impacted their journey, leading them to doing what they are passionate about. Today's episode is no different, and I can't wait for you to meet Diane. Diane, welcome. Thank you for joining me as a guest on Productive Passions today. It's such a pleasure having you here. Of course. Thank you so much. I am genuinely honored to be here. I know that you and I met like more than a decade ago. And so maybe two decades ago, actually. And so I'm very happy to be able to spend this time and have this very in-depth conversation with you. I appreciate that. I want to start out by asking you, without telling us your job title or credentials, can you explain what a day in the nine to five work life of Diane Monty looks like? Sure. Yeah. Uh, When I saw this question was going to be coming, it's definitely one of those ones that's hard for me to answer because I love that my day is so dynamic. You know, I very much so have a job where I am in the helping profession, but also working administratively, operationally. I'm supporting um, highly educated, credentialed, licensed people. And at the same time, setting up and making sure that we're able to touch lots of lives. And so that's very vague. And yet that is my day. I'm I'm working one to one with people and at the same time working in the background, just setting up workflows and just building uh, I'm in a startup world. And so certainly building things from the ground up. And that's quite a task. Having come recently from a startup organization myself, I understand that that work a lot of times, like you said, is from the ground up. There's a lot to go into an organization that doesn't already have a lot of structure in place. Absolutely. You know, me and my colleagues were regularly laughing and saying, you know, we're, we are absolutely building the ship as we're on it and as we're moving through the sea and we're pivoting as we need to. And it's just something that we jumped into and we accept and we love it. It's, it's very, very exciting. It can be very stressful and yet very invigorating as well. Well, without keeping folks in suspense any longer, what is it that you do? Sure. So I am a senior clinical director um, for a mental health organization, and I am a licensed clinical psychologist. I am still in practice, as I was mentioning. I certainly see people one-to-one still to see them for any variety of different mental health concerns. And then I also overseeing both providers as well as leaders who are doing the same work as me. On the other side of things, I'm certainly working on the operations side, like I was mentioning, and my other part of my role is to help create the workflows and standardization to make sure that the care we're delivering is high quality. So most people can't see us, so they can't see that you've got a dog who just hopped up and went and 
<laughs> Let him stay. Oh, there's something about pets that just makes people smile or changes the mood. So what's your dog's name? Well, so this is Pixel and she is tiny but mighty and she is uh, four years old. She is a mix of all the different things, but she's a lover. <laughs> Clearly. She, and as Diana saying that she's kissing her face. So the dog is Pixel is kissing Diane. That's so sweet. So Diane, what led you to choose psychology as a profession? Yeah, well, you know, from a very, very young age, I've always been just, I knew I was going to be a helper of some sort. What that looked like, I had no idea. But psychology specifically, I've always been so fascinated with the human condition, why people do the things they do, the the way they think, the way they make choices. And interestingly, it was actually my, uh, in high school, I was in a drama lit class and my teacher was introducing us to Carl Jung who came after Freud, who many people know who Freud is, of course, that's probably the most popular in psychology. psychology. Freud's, you know, face comes up and everybody thinks of all of the different things that he had done. And Carl Hume really did focus in on understanding exactly what we're talking about, human behavior, but from the context of helping people understand unconscious and the generational kind of influences that then help create someone's life and their choices and their values and why they behave the way that they do. And so I was just so fascinated with it. And so it was literally from that point on, I said, I want to know more about psychology and I'm going to be a psychologist. And so I was one of those very rare people that when I went into college, I stuck with psychology and knew what my end game was going to be. So you said something about generational influence. Does that mean like our parents and grandparents, how they affect who we are? Yes. So Carl Jung, his theories were very much so in that things are passed down through the generations, through artifacts. We see them in cultures. We see the same symbolism and such. And so there was this tying unity, not just with our own biological backgrounds, but like with the community around us as well. And so it was such an interesting, I was just so fascinated by it because it was this idea that we are all tied together in some which way or form, whether in the present, whether from the past. And so it really was such an interesting, it is such an interesting theory that very much so is still very much so alive, but lots of different offshoots of it from there. That's fascinating. I don't know if this has any impact, but as you're talking, I'm thinking I have an adopted son. Does that change anything when it comes to that theory and influences? Because he's still part of the culture that I live in. Right. I mean, I imagine that there, so as I mentioned, it's not just related to just the biological component of it. It means that now whatever you're bringing to the table and whatever backgrounds he has, even ones he's maybe unconscious of, now it blends into the the current present. And now he will then take your stuff, his stuff, and then carry it on into the rest of his life. And so it, it, again, doesn't have to be a biological tie. There's certainly, it's essentially, we are all influencing each other in some which way or form. And that's essentially the crux of what all of that is about. That's so fascinating. What is your favorite part of the work that you do? Sure. I, two different things. So I I mentioned that my role is very split. And just to give a little bit of background, for the most part in my career, I've always been this split person where I've been a person that has seen clients. My career has always been that I'm seeing clients one to one. And then I've always been very much so invested on the administrative operational side. So on the one to one side, I love those aha moments. It is magical for me to be in the room and help support my clients be able to create their own insights, create this ability to give permission to themselves to make choices that make sense for themselves. So that's so complex and I could probably talk about that for days, but that makes my heart just like burst every time I, I am able to be part of that person's journey to lay things out on the table with them and say, How does this all make sense for you in the moment, your past, your present, the things you want for your future? And how does that make sense for how you're going to then live your life? And so I love that. I'm not here to be the person that tells you what to do, but I'm helping to guide you to see your options. And so on that front, that's what I love. On the operational side, 
I just recognize that because the operational side, because I'm helping to standardize the care for a bigger group of people, then it has a larger net of impact. So while I love the one-to-one, if I can help to support that the care that people are receiving on a larger scale is wonderful, then that part is so incredible for me. Well, and that's really important, that standardization of care, because it allows clinicians, I'm guessing you're talking also about tools for clinicians that they can bring to the care that they provide their one-on-one clients. So it allows even a new clinician, correct me if I'm wrong, to have the tools from the experience and wisdom of people who have been doing it for a longer period of time. Is that a fair? Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I like to kind of compare it to when you go into a a regular medical office, right? When you want your doctor to have the experience that if I come in and I say, I've got a cough, I've got a fever, you want that doctor to have kind of a a somewhat of a roadmap of what step is, you know, is this needing to be escalated or is this just go home and have some water, take some Tylenol and you're okay? Or do I need to have more labs? Do I need to do something more, prescribe antibiotics? So on the side of the operations, to your point, we want to make sure that we're individualizing the approach because it, honestly, the human condition and psychology is for me a lot more complex than just being able to go into the doctor's office where there are a little bit more of the tangible, you can see what is actually going on. Whereas with the human psyche, there's so many different layers to it. Right. So what I'm saying is we want to individualize it, but we still have to have some validity in the the interventions that we're using, the modalities of treatment that we're doing. And so to your point, we want to be able to teach and ensure that whatever we're encouraging our providers to do is going to be best practice and has been proven to be effective for that person. So for our listeners who don't know what a modality is, can you just explain that? Yep. Yes. So modality is in reference to, I I guess I'll equate it again to like different kinds of medication. So different interventions, like different ways of treating someone. And so there are models of treatment. So maybe someone likes like they prefer to go to Western medicine, they go to their regular primary care doctor, or someone else might be very spiritual and decide, you know, no, I want to go to a spiritual healer. And they have more natural approaches with the things that they have me do, maybe I'm redoing my diet. And so on the psychology side, again, modality is the same thing. What type of theory Like, what is the theory that's driving the interventions, the skills that I'm going to have you do? Like, what is the crux of what it is that we believe is causing the quote unquote pain and then applying a certain intervention to that? So modalities kind of equals intervention. Is that correct? The interventions are going to come from the modality that you choose. So I'll name a couple because I think that people people are very familiar with like cognitive behavioral therapy, um, dialectical behavioral therapy, ACT is another one. And so if you ever hear those phrases, those are modalities. And each one of those modalities has a theory about why someone is suffering. For cognitive behavioral therapy, they really focus in on believing, you know, we got to focus in on those thoughts, the cognitive component of it, which then we can also look at the behaviors. And then that creates a good output of deciding how we're going to take care of the emotion. Whereas in ACT, ACT is acceptance and commitment therapy, where we're saying we're going to accept the pain of what is happening in this moment and still commit to doing something that is going to serve me and towards my values and towards my goals. And so again, slightly different tweaks on the theory that drives whatever it is the interventions are. So in a lot of the episodes that we've done on Productive Passions, a lot of guests have talked about their own mental health, their own struggles. Do you find that people who are considering a major change in their life have some of those similar struggles? Is that normal? I absolutely think it's normal because anytime you take someone and you change up what their body is used to, anytime you change that kind of status quo for them, the body physically is going to react. The mind is going to react. It's going to go, oh, we're going into uncharted territories. What are you doing? And it's going to start going. I always like to say it pulls out the filing cabinet of anything that remotely seems familiar 
and goes, was this okay? Or was this not okay? Do we need to think about this? And so it goes through this process of kind of deductive reasoning of, should I be worried about this or not? And if it is too overwhelming, that filing cabinet is so big that the person then starts to feel anxious. And that's usually when they start to notice a change in their mental health. It becomes so overwhelming. They can't even really think through it in a logical way. And so absolutely, I think when big transitions are happening, it's very normal that we're going to start to experience some feeling of imbalance. And I, I like to refer to it as allowing people to have a healthy level of mental distress or emotional distress, because those signal to us to pay attention. Do I actually need to go and get some help for it? Or is this just something that I need to make sure that I'm taking a pause to be thoughtful about these next steps that I'm going to be taking because these are big transitions for me? So the younger generation that I talk to seem to really embrace and be very comfortable talking about mental health, seeking care. But some of the previous generations, mine included, are more resistive to seeking mental health because of the stigma. Is that something that you experience that that maybe you have people that know they need some help but are concerned about the stigma? Absolutely. I mean, it goes back to what I was just talking about in terms of like going into uncharted territories, the unknown. If like you're mentioning, you were not raised in a generation where it was not an acceptable thing. You know, showing emotions was seen as a bad thing equated to weakness. There were these narratives mm. that were attached to it. Then if I come in as a professional and say, huh, I think that's what this is related to, my experience is, of course, skepticism or rejection. And so, yes, absolutely. That's very, very common. And it's something that we're still fighting with, even with the current generation. There's still that mixed bag of feeling that stigma and not wanting to talk about it because it's still, I think people are just so unclear about what it means to get mental health support or to, to know what emotions are, the ranges of emotions and what they actually can be productive for you or non-productive for you. You know, I was just talking about having like a healthy version of anxiety. And even when I say that to some of my clients, they're like, wait, you want me to still have anxiety? I'm like, it actually is beneficial for you. If you were not anxious, at least to some degree, you would not get yourself out of bed to go to work, to go, you know, take care of your kids, to take care of yourself, you would probably be very blasé about all the things. And so we need a, a healthy version or a healthy level of our emotions. And I like the way you phrase that mental health support. So because I seek mental health care, it doesn't mean that I'm crazy. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my family. If I get pulled over by the police, they're going to see that I have this history of seeking mental health care and think I'm crazy too. I have to take a breath on that. You're right. And yet what you mentioned earlier, I think is still something it is a societal need to change those stereotypes. For if someone does share very openly that I get mental health treatment or that I get mental health support or I have this diagnosis that there are going to be those people that are going to stereotype them and say, oh, well, they're a depressed person. So they're not going to get out of bed. They're not going to be responsible. And so it is this very big challenge of having to correct at a larger scale, the societal perspective of what it means when someone is getting mental health support, to your point. It really, I'm, I'm such an advocate of uh, making sure that mental health is seen as no different than someone getting physical health. Like when they go to the doctor, you know, it's, oh, good for you. You went and got your checkup, you know? Oh, you, you went and got, you, going back to that cold, like you went and got that cough checked up, good for you. We don't want you to get worse, right? And so no different. If you're starting to feel sad and you're really struggling, good for you that you went to go get that support, even though we need to label it as quote unquote depression or anxiety. It just lets us label it so that going back to the interventions, we know what protocols do we need to put in place to support that person so that it's effective for them. And I love how you talk about equating it to physical health, because I think that does help to normalize the conversations around mental health. And then also people being unafraid to speak up and talk about their own mental health challenges. And here on the podcast, we have 
many examples of people who have done that. People who have actually followed their passion because of mental health challenges. So to to your point, that anxiety, sometimes it's the anxiety, a certain level of it is necessary to keep us moving, right? To keep us moving forward. Absolutely. And one of the things I talk about regularly is I kind of joke about it. I call them my personal propellants. And those are times in my life where it seems like the bottom had fallen out, literally like feeling like this is it. This is the end. Things are so terrible. But those being the moments of pivot, a pivotal change in my life that had those things not happened. I would not have progressed on to do other things that I wanted to do. And nobody wants to go through that hardship. But sometimes those hardships are exactly what lead us on to greater things if we allow them to. That piece, that last sentence that you just said is probably the most essential. If we allow them to, and it goes back to the perspective that you take of that situation that you just experienced, that how you interpret that situation. You can interpret it as I've fallen and I've hit my rock bottom and there's nowhere up from here and I will stay down. Or you can take it in that mentality that you were just describing of being able to take that pause and go, okay, wait, what's next? I'm going to believe that there is something that I can learn from this situation. And then, so going back to ACT actually, accept that this is a hard situation right now, but I'm going to commit to knowing that my North Stars for myself and my values are that I want to be successful in life and how I define that is very different for everybody. But if I have things that I still want in my life, I'm going to still commit to even engaging in small goals that are going to get me there, regardless if I've hit quote unquote rock bottom. I want to go back a little bit to talk about you and what you do. What are some of the typical challenges that you experience as a psychologist, but also in your own life? Sure. Yeah. As a psychologist, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, I didn't realize how complex, of course, this profession would be because I really did think of it in the context of like, oh, well, it's like, a doctor that, you know, I'm going to go to a medical doctor, you know, you're going to have all the things kind of laid out for you only to come to realize that again, humans are incredibly complex. (laughs) And you, no matter what you do, everybody is going to be so different. And you have to take that into account. Every client that comes in the room, they're coming, I was talking about the layers of generations that they bring to the table, the values that they have, then I have to take into consideration my own Mm -hmm. and really watch myself and make sure that I'm in a place of non-judgment, that I'm not putting my biases on them, that I'm not over-influencing and directing them and advising them in a way that I think is good for me just because of my own experiences. And that is tough, you know, and I'm not going to say that any of us are perfect at it. I, I will call any provider out that says that like they don't run into that sometimes where they catch themselves, maybe that creeping up and them not even realizing sure. it, right? But that is the challenge is being able to be that objective person in the room and really be the support that's standing next to the person instead of overly directing them. The other is, you know, sometimes we'll get people that are, they're just, they're in this like contemplative mode of, I don't, I want a change in my life, but I'm, I'm stuck and I don't know if I can actually do it. And so that part is challenging too. Not that it's not something that I love. I love working with it. It's what my profession is. It's usually what's rocking through the door, but it's challenging because you also don't want to push someone uh, when they're not ready. They have to be ready right. for it. And so we just don't want to harm them more by pushing them too far. Well, and I think that's important, especially in light of what this podcast is about. It's about people who feel like they're ready to move on, but might feel stuck in one way or another. And sometimes it's fear that keeps us stuck, but sometimes there are other legitimate reasons that we are stuck and maybe need to stay where we are for a period of time. And that's got to be hard to really decipher. Am I just being scared to move on? Or is this really appropriate to be making this change at this point in my life? 
that's got to be a really hard, to your point, a hard consideration to decipher. And that's what we spend the most time in therapy for. But I mean, think about how incredibly powerful it is when someone's actually able to really think through that and feel like that's why I always describe like putting all the options out there, putting all the thoughts out there and being able to just non-judgmentally, again, very objectively be open to all of the things and then make a really thoughtful decision about it. Because once you make that decision, how empowered do you feel and how wonderfully connected do you feel to that decision that you've made because you've been so thoughtful about how you've made that decision rather than it being something that you made on the whim, on the fly. And now I have all these consequences that I have to you know, deal with because yes, maybe this decision felt good at first and now I'm, I'm paying for that. Maybe I didn't have enough money to like make that transition and take that trip or whatever move that job and now I'm losing my house because of it. So absolutely, I think that's the crux of the work. And when you put in that work, I mean, I going back to, to what I love, I'm just thinking about a couple of my clients now, the light that you see with these people. I mean, they're beaming, they're sitting up taller and they are so just confident in knowing exactly what their path is. They clear the path for themselves. And I love that. I love what you just said. And that's, I think I just had an aha moment with what you talked about. And there's always a place, always in every interview where I want to rewind and hit play again. And this would be one of those places where you talked about the work that somebody did to get to a place to make a decision and then feel very good about it. That's probably what's needed when we're making these big decisions is that work to really consider all of these things and not a rash decision. Know that it was not a a rash decision made when you were angry, when you were overly excited, but really put thought into it. Then you can feel confident and maybe a little bit less afraid. Absolutely. I'm going to be a little nerdy and talk psychology right now. So there's a- Please do. Thought from dialectical behavioral therapy, where it focuses in on this recognition that we have these two parts of our minds. We have the logical, rational side, and then we have the emotional mind. And what you you really want to get yourself getting good at is being in what's called the wise mind, which is a blend of the two. And so you don't want to be overly analytical about like, well, this is, I'm going to make this decision because this is just the right decision. You know, I, I thinking about like those movies where someone has like the pros and cons list and they're overarching on like the risks and benefits. And like, it's, it's so incredibly rigid, but there's no heart to the decision. Right. And so the idea of the wise mind is being able to thoughtfully think through what is the emotional, you know, gain what's the emotional consequence here? What's the logical gain and logical consequence? Again, look at all that together. And then in the wise mind, when we are in a calm muscle body, when we are able to think straight, we then make a decision and move forward. And so in dialectical behavioral therapy, that's like one of the cruxes of the things that we focus in on is getting people into that wise mind to be able to hold those two things together. And that helps them form a great foundation for decision making. (laughs) I'm smiling right now because you and I had a little bit of a conversation before we started recording. And I shared with you that recently my husband was made a really fantastic job offer. We were both very, very excited about it. Then the company he works for countered and made him a very good offer to stay. And so we did exactly what you just talked about. We did the pros and cons list. And I remember saying to him, you know, this is important, really looking at this analytically. But given who I am and what I do and this podcast, I really want you to think about if everything is equal. What excites you the most? And it doesn't have to be the decision based on that, but Let's have a pros and cons list, but let's also consider what feels right. So yes. it's so interesting. This will be another one of those spots where I push rewind and I play it for repeatedly. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, all joking aside, I think that's really important because we can get into things that we can get overly analytical and not take into consideration how it's going to impact our life, how it's going to impact our 
quality of life day to day. And in my experience, that can't be overstated to consider that for that to be a consideration because you don't just close the door on work and walk into your home life totally unaffected what happened all day long or all night whenever you work. Exactly. You know, I'll, I'll share very personally, but that's the conversation that my husband and I are constantly having to remind ourselves about when we think about like changing jobs or any of that stuff, we're, we're constantly checking on each other on, we're not trying to chase the paycheck. You know, we, we know at a base level because we've done our work too, though, to be able to say kind of where do we need to be comfortable and happy from a financial standpoint and also from the perspective of like, what are the things that we value the most? We value family and we value time the most. And if the income is higher and it doesn't creep into those other parts that are really important to us on the heart side, okay, great, let's take that job and like maybe let's move up and do all the things and maybe there's going to be some sacrifices to having to work a little bit more. But if it encroaches on those other heart sides too much, we're going, "Uh uh-uh, let's let's not do that. Remember, like we're not chasing the high paycheck. It's not just for that. That's the, again, the the analytical, oh, most people are like, oh, we'll just get more money, more money. No, no, no. What about all the other things? Like you said, what's the domino effect of taking that, that step of taking that money, taking that job, whatever it may be. Well, and recently you shared with me a pivotal moment in your life where you and your husband decided to walk away from very successful careers in the Bay Area and move south to San Diego. Yeah. Can you tell us where that idea came from? Why and what changes that entailed, not only for you, but for your family? Sure. I like to to first share that the idea is that my husband's going to say it came from him to come to San Diego. It's just always been the thing because when we got together, he was living in San Diego. He's from San Diego and we moved away to the Bay Area. And anyways, all joking aside, you know, we do feel like we did a lot in the Bay Area. We it's like where where I've really got my career started and kind of built myself up pretty quickly. He did the same thing. We moved Mm -hmm. up the ladder pretty quickly. That also meant a lot of high responsibility, a lot of long hours. And when we had kids, of course, all of that shifts, you know, how do you juggle taking the kids to daycare, say first or first son? How do you make sure that he's well attended to, that we're being still good parents and balancing that? And with one, it was fine-ish, <laughs> if I'm being honest. And then <laughs> it was also very personally shared that it was actually probably our second son and our situation there that was the biggest pivotal aha for us in a like, we need a change in our life. I'm not going to go into all the details with it because I could literally do a full podcast on this too. He was born three months early. Uh, Not only was he born three months early, but he ended up being diagnosed with a congenital diaphragmatic hernia. I had surgery at seven days old, stayed in the NICU for 61 days. All this equates to my husband and I, I had to go out, of course, like on a sudden maternity leave because I did, I delivered so early. So thankfully my job at the time was incredibly supportive. His job was flexible enough. And so he was able to still, we had, he kept his income and was literally working bedside with me when I was both in the hospital. And then when I finally got out, we were just Oh my gosh, so much juggling going on between running to the hospital, then, you know, taking care of our other son, who was at the time two, two and a half, and trying to make things normal. And then I went back to work after Hayden finally came home after 61 days. And that's when things just felt even more chaotic. Like, we were again like I was trying to be the best at my job. I was a I was a manager, and if you I mean Chrissy, you know me, like I'm going to put 110 percent into everything yes. I do. And so, how do you put 110 percent into doing what I just explained to all of you? What I do, pouring into other people, and then trying to pour into my family. We've right. got our two very young children who need us, and. Still, our youngest had so many medical issues. We were running back and forth to the hospital all the time for that. 
And so when things finally calmed down a bit, I, and I say that lightly because I don't think that they ever really calmed down, but uh, we were so grateful and thankful that my mom has always been a very big part and support in our life where when things kind of finally calmed down, Tony and I finally decided to go take a vacation and we had 10 uninterrupted days together. And of course, magical, we went to Italy and we're sitting and we're having wine and eating at nine o'clock at night kind of laughing and saying, I think it was, he said something to the effect of like, what if we just slowed everything down? Like, it's been so nice, like these last couple of days, like to just be able to like, pause, we finally got that time to just pause and do all the things that I was just telling you we need to be doing. And, and spend time with each other. We spend time with each other, finally reconnect, like make sure that again, we're like realigning and still aligned with the values and all the things. And so when he jokingly said, what if we just slowed everything down? I was like, well, what are you thinking? And he said, well, what if we just moved to San Diego? You know, and so it was just this, it was just thrown out there as like a ha ha ha. And then we both as the trip progressed, we said, really, like, I mean, we'll have to think about it more, of course, but like, we're good. Like generally speaking, you know, Hayden's and in, in his health is a bit more stable. We were very tied to the Bay Area because of like the medical care that we were getting there. And we, we just didn't want to mess with that. But he was more stable right. jobs. I was like, I'm in a profession that can move anywhere, really. Like, I, I don't think that I need to be tied. I loved my job. So don't get me wrong. I think that's always hard. And yet I was stressed out, like the the amount of time I had to spend. And again, that like pouring into, he was the same way. His job was, was pretty flexible. And so we, by the end of the trip said, I think we're going to move. Like this is, this was October, by the way, of 2019. And we said, why don't we move by January? Wow. <laughs> and we came home. yeah. And so anyways, that is what our pivotal moments were, were the, I guess it, it's hard to say because when you say pivotal moment, it was like a buildup, a multitude of things. And it, it was finally a moment of just pausing and being able to be reflective of our life, which I'm going to advocate to do that way more often. We're doing it way more often now. I don't think that we were able to do that because we felt like we were in crisis mode before. But it was then that we made that decision that we really needed to move towards the things that we were passionate about. And that, like I said, really helped us think about we really miss spending more time with our kids, with each other, right. and able to just like live and not feel like so rushed and pressured by all the different things outside of us. And we felt like San Diego could give that to us. Sure. So you really know what it's like to follow your passion. Absolutely. I'd like to share with our audience that besides experiencing the unknown and really turning your world upside down, you are Productive Passions expert for mental health and wellness. So that's important for me to have you in partnership because we talk about a lot of things and we have guests who share very, very personal, intense feelings. And I am a clinician by background. I am not a psychologist. I am an occupational therapist by background. So I wanted to have your expertise alongside me as I go through these podcasts and through these interviews. And as we talked about a little bit earlier, we have known each other for quite a long time. We worked in the same organization where you were the clinical director for my area because of, I think, what the audience can see, can hear in you is your real passion and commitment to helping other people and that you you truly care. You never just showed up for work, did your job and went home. You really cared for not just the, the individuals who were one-on-one -on -one with you, but your colleagues. And that was so incredibly important. So I thank you for being the mental health expert, Productive Passions. We're, we've got a lot going on. There's going to be so much more. And having you there to talk to, to even join us on some other podcasts. Um, I'm very much looking forward to thank you for being that for us. Of course, I was thrilled. I know in the early stages before you even really launched any of this, you had just shared with me this idea and I was 
thrilled to hear that this was the direction you were going. I think you and I really connected on that piece of being able to follow your passion. You know, you had reached out to me and said, like, I see that you made this like big change and want to know more about it. But there's this idea that I have and I'm so, you know, I, I'm doing it myself. And so I, what what if we did like a podcast? Oh my gosh, that sounds amazing. I would love to be a part of that. I knew where your heart was in it. And so I am so thrilled and honored, like I said, to be here. And I want to invite any listeners that may have questions to send them in. In the show notes for this podcast, there's always today's takeaways, but there's also how to get a hold of myself and the guests that I'm speaking with. So we will share information about how you could reach out to Diane and how you could reach out to me. And I'd absolutely love to hear from some of our listeners about maybe some of the questions that they have, um, some of the challenges that they've experienced. Because as I said earlier, one of the things that I'm finding very consistently is this evolution people tend to go through. There's typically fear. There's typically a me? Can I do this? Frequently, people are dealing with naysayers or people who tell them they can't do it. So there's a lot to navigate as people decide whether or not to take a plunge. One of the things I know I had asked you, and I'm happy for you to share your ideas on this, is is there an online assessment or tool that we could use to self-assessment for resilience? What was your response to that? So my response to it very openly was, I don't advocate for me giving you a self-assessment tool. I, I think that it's really hard because there, it's one data point is what I'll say. And what I worry about is people go and they'll do some of these self-assessments. And then admittedly, like I've, I've seen it way too often where people start self-diagnosing themselves. Mm -hmm. And I just am really on the side of if you are concerned, or if you want to know more about your resilience, one, you can read about resiliency and just kind of understand kind of what the key components of it are. Some of those things are going to be really related to some of the things we talked about here. How well do you know yourself in terms of your ability to be flexible? You know, Christy, you talked about like this acceptance piece as well with being able to pivot and accept when you were in that rock bottom and, and look towards the perspective that is something that's more positive. So checking your mindset and seeing, you know, what's going on there. Do I have tendencies to have what we call like polarized thinking? If I'm in that space, then maybe got to check my resiliency because if I'm more in the black and white space, I'm probably not mm -hmm. going to be super resilient. Resiliency is definitely built on the ability to ask for help and have community support around you, knowing more clearly what your values are, developing very concrete goals for yourself. I think all of those things and just naming some of those things to kind of have people start to think about them more generally. And then instead of going to a tool, I think I would really recommend talking to someone professional because like I said, that person is going to be able to help lay out all the different components of your life as well as check you. I hate saying it that way, but I'll say it that way where we sometimes don't even realize that we are maybe minimizing or over overlooking something that it could be something that is going to impact the decisions that we make. And as you're talking to a therapist or a coach or someone else, they can reflect those things back to you. And then you can go, oh, wait, that's not what I meant at all, or that's not actually how things are. And so I, I really advocate for seeing the professional to be able to talk these things out. Very good. Last question. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between seeing a psychologist and working with a coach? It's a good question because the field has evolved so much. Right. So psychologists could be coaches, coaches could be psychologists. And so it really is about being able to know what you're looking for. So a psychologist in and of itself you, a licensed psychologist, is going to be someone that has been, you know, board credential. They certainly have gotten their license to do an entity. That's similar with there's so many different credentials for therapy now. So there's psychologists, there's MFTs, marriage family therapists, licensed clinical social worker. Now there's like the licensed professional counselor. And so generally speaking, depending on what your need is, is going to be dependent on who you go to. So that's how I'll, I'll frame it that way. So generally people that are going to go to a coach, they are maybe needing something very, very specific. 
career coaching. They're going to really zero in on focusing in on career. Maybe it's like leadership coaching. It can be, it's, it's usually very niche. There are general life coaches. I can't really speak to like exactly what they do. I mean, it's general life coach. Like it's, they're there to help kind of talk things out. Like I was just mentioning to you where they can help you gain that insight that you might not have for yourself on all the different realms of your life. So I I believe that's the focus of life coaches. Whereas generally speaking, when people are wanting to go to a coach, it's like, it's for very niche things. When I think about like the, the work that I do and the work that I do with the providers that I work with, we are seeing people that are have mental health concerns in the in the context of their emotional well-being is so dysregulated it's it's so hard to get through that it's impacting their functioning and so it it raises it to the, that level i guess that's the best way i can describe it is that it's how we refer to it in in technical terms is it's it meets medical necessity and so yes. If you are someone that is experiencing a higher degree of anxiety and depression so much that it is impacting your functioning, I highly advocate going for a therapist that is going to be able to focus in on those things versus a coach. Again, I'm not a coach. I've never been a coach, so I don't want to misspeak there. But generally speaking, I'd say they work with people that are more in the like mildish area, whereas we are working with people that are are more impacted by this in their life. Well, and correct me if I'm wrong, psychologists can diagnose, can really help to look at symptoms and say, this is what this is versus, you know, maybe um, sharpening a skill for better speaking, for preparing to move to the next level in a career, for deciding what somebody wants to be or do, psychology is more on the medical side of things. Is that fair to say? That's fair to say. And and I'll generalize that to like, you know, not just against all the different credentials that I mentioned. So I don't want to do them a disservice. Definitely like all psychologists can diagnose, like any of those credentials that I mentioned to you have been again, you know, they've taken their licensure, they keep up with their licensures, they keep up with best practices. And so they are the people that are, I guess you could say they're vetted, even in the process of us bringing on clients at the company that I'm at, we have an onboarding process, and there's questions, and then we can help decide, you know, is this the level of care that you're needing? Or maybe it is a coach that you're just needing. If you're needing more skills based, I love that you said that more skills based type of things, you're still functioning in the world fairly well, then a coach probably makes more sense for you. Whereas again, Again, if it is impacting your functioning, what I mean by that, I'm not really able to like get to work and get my deadlines done and be able to get up to take care of myself. Or maybe I'm noticing I'm isolating from my children or my friends. That is what we say when it's, it's more significantly impacting someone's functioning. And to your point, a diagnosis, again, helps frame what is the treatment that you need? What is the medication, like going to the doctor? What is the intervention that we need here? And it's just a higher level of, of support. Diane, I want to thank you for spending time with us today. And I look forward to more of your insight and expertise as we go forward with this podcast. I will put your information where people can find you in the show notes. And just again, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. I love our conversations. I always feel like the time goes by so quickly. And it's just making me think of all the different topics that you and I are going to continue to have conversations on. (laughs) Agreed. I can't wait for feedback from people. So more to come. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.